so hello welcome to uh your questions answered mental health and dystonia which is another of our reach out reach all webinars um Awareness Month is almost over, so I can't believe we've had a month of it, uh, but it's almost over. But tonight we've got an absolutely fabulous webinar prepared for you. And we are delighted to be joined by the fantastic Dr. Jennifer Foley. Hi, Jennifer. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Foley is a senior clinical um, neuropsychologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen's Square, and also, because that's not busy enough, an honorary lecturer at UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. Um, so what that is, is leading the hospital's uh, neuropsychology service for people with movement disorders, um, including dystonia and Parkinson's. Um, also, uh, Dr. Foley is the lead of Parkinson's UK Excellent Network Mental Health Hub, and it's helping NHS England adapt and improve um, uh, in improving access to psychological therapies, uh, which you might hear described as IAPT, I believe is the way that you pronounce that, uh, program, which um, accommodates people with neurological uh, disorders. Today, Jennifer will start with a short presentation um, about some of the best ways we can support our own mental health well-being and then we'll head into a Q&A. So without any further ado, I'm pretty sure you're all bored of hearing my voice. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Foley for the slides in the presentation. So I'm Jennifer, I work at the National Hospital and we see lots of people with dystonia there. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, the sorts of mental health issues that can pop up in dystonia and what might be, the, might be a good way of trying to get a bit of control back to look after your mental health yourself to try to create the best life for yourself living with dystonia. So, you know that um, the obvious symptoms of dystonia are those that lie above the surface here. It's these abnormal muscle contractions, it's the fixed posture, some people experience tremor. But, but below the surface, we know that there's a whole host of other symptoms, right? And some of that, for some people, will include things like anxiety and low mood. For other people, you know, pain might be a significant issue or fatigue um, and all of these, all of these non-motor symptoms are likely going to have an impact on how you feel emotionally. And so it's perhaps unsurprising, therefore, that um, you know, people can go through a whole range of different emotions when they're living with dystonia. And that will fluctuate from just sort of normal thoughts and feelings of, you know, I'm living with this pain, it's really hard, and I'm feeling really low, or feeling anxious, like that's just completely normal. And then other people who will be struggling with quite severe anxiety depression that doesn't that sticks around that doesn't sort of go away doesn't fluctuate it's just it's just there and it's a real problem and it's affecting quality of life and so what's really important is to is to then think about well how how do you help yourself because we know that there are nhs treatments but what can you be doing to help yourself manage um, your mood as effectively as possible so that's what i'm going to cover i'm going to cover all these different sorts of things so for a lot of people with dystonia, obviously they develop it at some point. Um, and uh, at that time, then they have to come to terms with these whole new symptoms, this new set of symptoms. And when they first start, it's, it's really normal to go through a whole process of thinking, gosh, what, what are these symptoms gonna mean for me? You know, what, what does, um, how is this gonna impact my life? Um, what's gonna happen in the future? And people can get very anxious about that, especially if the dystonia becomes more severe with time. But then after a while, after adjusting to these sorts of concerns, or perhaps after leveling out of the symptoms, or after sort of some time, people can start to get into a, into a sort of um, phase of thinking, well, okay, so I've got these symptoms, I've got the dystonia, what's the, what, how, how do I manage this as best as I can? What is the best way of, of living with this dystonia? And, and what do I need to change so I can still do the things that I've always enjoyed? So rather than sort of giving up on things because it's difficult because of dystonia, you might want to think about, or people start to think along the lines of, well, how can I, how can I tweak things so 
so that I can still do the things that I that I like to do. And when people get to that stage, when people start to feel that they can that they can adapt, we call that sort of psychological adjustment. It's when you sort of come to terms or you you've got to some sort of equilibrium with the symptoms. So you're not it's it's not um it, the, the symptoms don't fudge you so much, but there's some sort of sense of okay, I've got the symptoms. How do I cope? You know, so that's a sort of like psychological adjustment of of coming to terms with with the dystonia. But a, but a lot of people with dystonia do have some sort of um, problem with anxiety or low mood. So in this study um, in 2016. They looked at 50 people with cervical dystonia and they found that um, nearly half of them, as you can see here, have um, anxiety, had an anxiety disorder. So everyone experiences some anxiety from time to time, but an anxiety disorder is one that stops you from doing things. So for, for most of the people, this anxiety was um, related to going out or seeing people. Whereas low mood or a depression which was severe enough to affect quality of life was less common but but certainly present and so we know that i mean this is just one study but we know that for a lot of people the lifetime risk of developing um, a, a mood disorder such as anxiety is, is fairly high for, for for people with dystonia and of course you know it will differ across different types of dystonia um, uh, and but this is um, one study with people with um, cervical dystonia. Um, so why is this? What are what are the causes of, of low mood or anxiety and dystonia? And so there's, there is some evidence to suggest that the underlying neurophysiology of dystonia, which you know it's a bit opaque, what exactly is causing the dystonia for different people, but for for many it might be something to do with the underlying neurophysiology. Part of the reasoning for this is that there, the rates are very high. This seems to be higher than um, other people or other conditions that also have visible symptoms. So for example, I think one study compared people with dystonia to people with alopecia and they found that people with dystonia had higher rates of anxiety and low mood than people with alopecia. So it suggests that it's not just a case of having a um, a, a visible symptom or a visible difference from other people that's causing this um, emotional reaction. Also, another factor has been that some people have shown that genetics might contribute to low mood, particularly. So, a recent study um, from the team, one of the teams here at Queen Square, found that um, some genetic predispositions might might cause people to have an increased likelihood of developing a depression over their lifetime as well as an increased risk of, of um, the dystonia. So there's some sort of shared function of the gene which seems to impact both mood and um, the dystonia. And people have found that the symptoms sometimes of low mood and anxiety can sometimes predate the um, uh, the dystonia. So it suggests that it may be something that's um, brewing perhaps as a cause of the neurophysiology um, before the symptoms um, and, and so therefore it's not just a reaction to the symptoms themselves. But nonetheless there will also, um, you know, living with dystonia comes with such a set of difficulties for many people that um, irrespective of if there is an underlying neurophysiological cause there is bound to be a psychological impact of living with dystonia. And you know, um, for for that for people for different people it will manifest in different ways. Or it will be difficult for people in different ways. And that a lot of that it's to do with your previous life experience. So the person who you are and the way that the dystonia affects you combines to really sort of um, shape your risk of low mood or anxiety. So if you are um, have always been a very outgoing person that has really enjoyed. Um, socialising and being the centre of the party and then you know you, you develop cervical dystonia for example that really affects your ability to, to, to um, socialise or the pain is so much so that it completely changes your way of life and obviously that's going to have an impact upon upon your mood and it, I think it's about recognising that as um, and, and its contribution to your mood. And we know that um, depression, disability, not necessarily the severity of symptoms, but the disability that it causes and the pain that the dystonia causes are the best predictors of quality of life 
at least in several fields of Smithsonian. So we know that there is a massive impact for many people um, as a consequence of these um, mood disorders. So what do you do about it? So there, um, the NHS approach, um, you know, the sort of um, the typical thing that happens if you go see your doctor and you complain of low mood or anxiety is that you might be offered medication um, or you might be offered psychological therapies. And for many people, that will be through um, what, uh, what Dana was talking about earlier, this um, uh, increasing access to psychological therapies called IAPT, which is um, NHS England's um, uh, service for people with um, low mood or anxiety uh, in sort of um, when it's not so much of an issue when it's um, maybe sort of low to medium severity of low mood or anxiety. Um, and, and often you can just refer yourself to those services, they're in every borough, and, um, but there is some difficulties in that obviously you'll meet a counsellor, that counsellor might have never met anyone else with dystonia, and um, you might have to explain how the symptoms affect you. And of course, you know, that, that might be the case, even if it's, you know, someone like myself at Queen Square, you know, who meets lots of people with dystonia, the dystonia will affect everybody in a completely different way. Everyone's you know, journey with dystonia is different. But some people um, find that difficult to, to speak to people who don't have a concept of what dystonia is. So that's the that's what the NHS currently um, provides. And if you need much more sort of support than what that that offers, then there can be more sort of intensive support from psychiatry or from community mental health teams, which are above and beyond these two options here. But for, for most people sort of living with dystonia, these will be probably the two two ways that they'll, they'll be offered for psychological support. And, and, and so that's great, but there's so much more that you can do to help yourself and your mood that doesn't rely upon NHS. And that gives you back so much more control over your life and over your symptoms. And, and this sort of self-management approach is something that the NHS is, is not so good at promoting um, because they're just focused on sort of, you know, um, crisis management. But really this sort of self-management is, is, is the best way to, to, to manage your mood with what, living with Estonia. I'm just going to go through that quickly and then we can talk a bit more in the Q&A. So what can you do? So there's like these different aspects of um, what I think are the sort of crucial tenets of well-being, which um, we're going to talk about in a little detail. And so the first one of this is exercise. So um, exercise is so good for people with um, long-term conditions, with neurological conditions. Um, in some conditions, it seems to be able to really have a neuroprotective effect. And some of those effects have only been found recently, which suggests that um, there will be emerging more research coming out to say that exercise will have a neuroprotective or um, neurogenic effect. So that's actually improving uh, neurons in the brain. Um, and you know, that's been found for MS, it's been found for Parkinson's disease. And so really sort of trying to do as much as you can exercise wise is, is a really good idea. And it doesn't matter how, how much disability you're living with, you know, there, you can be doing it um, on, on, the, um, on Zoom, you can be doing it in groups for people with disability. So for example, this is the bottom one on the left hand side is disabled ramblers. So people who are living with um, disabilities who are just getting out and about and going walking together, doesn't matter what you look like or what sort of disabilities you come with, um, but it's people who want to act to be out and, and enjoy the um, outside. You can also have um, neurophysio neurophysiotherapy to help give you some ideas on how to exercise with your symptoms. So if you're really struggling with your symptoms and knowing how to start an exercise regime, you can maybe request neurophysiotherapy um, we have neurophysiotherapy at Queen Square. You might also have it in the community, or there are private neurophysiotherapists. Um, there's um, lots of groups for people who have disabilities of some sort that want to exercise. And so, I really would, um, I would really recommend that you try to pursue as much exercise as you can because it's so good for endorphins and anything good for your mental health is, is good for your physical health as well. And then on top of that is it's organizing activities that are enjoyable and that give you a sense of mastery. And those are two separate things sometimes, but um, pleasurable activities for you will be, might be different for the things that I, I love 
um, I love massage, so that's why I've got a picture of it here. Um, and, you know, you might love listening to music or it might be something else that you really love that, you know, you, you maybe are spending all the energy that you have just doing chores. And so you, you don't have any time left over for doing enjoyable things. So trying to make sure that you, you schedule in enjoyable activities into your week is really important as well as activities that give you a sense of mastery. So that's a sense of doing something. So even if people are no longer able to work, you might want to think about how you can keep your, your brain ticking over for, so I was speaking today to someone who's quite disabled and we, we agreed that he loves history and that maybe he would think about going to some exhibitions um, at the British Museum or, you know, um, thinking about a course um, in history or some people like to take part in research um, as a participant that can really help you feel engaged with the community and doing something about, um, uh, about the long term condition that they're living with. Um, also, oh, that's a, a, a mistake, sorry, but um, managing your mood um, also means socialising, being with other people and but finding your right sort of communities. So sometimes, you know, um, people can feel, particularly with dystonia, they can feel very anxious about socialising um, because of perhaps of visible differences. And so it's important to have your communities where you feel supported. And this is a real um, important aspect of living with any long-term condition, but particularly dystonia. So that's your family. It's, um, it, it's having people that you might do certain things with. So maybe you go to the cinema with someone or you, um, you uh, I had a patient yesterday, someone that she and her friends who were both disabled um, will phone each other and decide what they're going to watch together that night. And they both have a, both are not very able to get out and about, but really enjoy that sense of community. Um, it's also important to have a confidant. So to have someone that you could talk to about your feelings. And if you don't have that, then you might want to think about pursuing counseling or something like that to en enable to, you to, to actually have someone to talk to you about what it's like to live with dystonia and, and, and how best to cope with it. And then also your dystonia communities where um, feeling uh, like, I mean, I, this is preaching to the converters, you're obviously part of a community here, but, you know, having that sense of being with other people who know what it's like to have um, these sorts of issues is, is very important. Um, and then also stress control. So um, here are just some examples. So progressive muscular relaxation is one that um, can be very good. And that's sort of going around all your muscles around your body to try to relax them in turn and that overall can really reduce your level of tension which can reduce anxiety that can make you feel much better um, as well as um, mindfulness or meditation so um, people can um, sometimes really enjoy that sense of having a control over their thought processes rather than letting anxieties or worries just flood you it's about it's about exerting some level of control over your thought processes by um, stilling your mind. And there's lots of apps for, for enabling you to do that at home, as well as <clears throat> things like yoga or Pilates that can be very helpful, um, particularly for um, heightened muscular tension. And then lastly, it's about sort of um, uh, managing negativity. So we can all be a bit negative from time to time but when that negativity starts to flood us it can be very hard to to um think positively about anything um and sometimes just sort of checking your thought processes to see if you're focusing on the negative or, or, or worrying about something that isn't happening and is unlikely to happen and whether there's an, an, a different way that you can think about a situation and so here is like um, a series of questions that can interrogate your thinking processes to try to um to try to make you question the validity of some of these negative thoughts. And so this is the sort of thing that you might do if you were doing cognitive behavioral therapy, where a therapist might go through these sorts of questions with you to try to help you think through um, whether any of these um, thought errors, we call them, might be applicable. So that's, for example, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't ever go out because people look at me and they'll think that I'm, you know, uh, I look terrible. It's about sort of maybe drilling down on that to sort of say, well, is that the case? Does everyone think that? Might they, might they also think something else? You know, what would you think if you saw someone who had similar symptoms to you? 
So really sort of trying to drill down on those sorts of processes, thought, thought processes, to try to sort of shift some of that negativity. So that's just a quick example of um, uh, challenging negativity. So really the take home message is that there's lots to be done to um, help manage your mood and, and, and in self management that's really you taking control and you sort of putting together your um, your um, self management protocol what you're going to do to look after your 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 mood and I'm sure you've already got this down but for many people sometimes they just need a bit of um, a bit of support um, and if that's the case then just you know, reach out and, and ask for help. Sometimes that's best from the GP, or sometimes that could be a, you know through your neurology team, um, or through someone else in your care care support. But 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 the important thing is is to reach out for help if you do require it, because these are um, very common issues. And if you know about it, then then we can provide you with some support. Amazing! Thank you so much. That was a really a really great presentation and and really informative and I think people will take a lot I know I did take a lot away from it um there's a whole host of questions that we've got so if it's all right with you I'm gonna I'm gonna dive straight in um so there's a few things actually that you covered in your presentation so if we start with those um we have been asked uh our depression or low mood and feeling um and feeling that there's no hope common with people with dystonia so is that a common feeling for people to have yeah absolutely you know that i mean feeling of no hope can can be present in um anxiety or in dystonia or sorry or in um depression so it's you know that sort of sense of hopelessness can can happen with either of those and certainly both of those conditions, anxiety and low mood, um, uh, anxiety and depression are, are very common. But as I said, you know, it's, it's really normal to have those sorts of dark thoughts, to have to feel low or anxious at some point. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have, you know, anxiety or depression. It just, it's a normal emotion to have. We all have these emotions from time to time. But certainly, you know, if they persist, if they stick around, if they're not getting any better, then that's the time to, to reach out for some help or to, well, first of all, to think about what can you do to, to sort of try to take a bit more control over your mood so that you don't feel um, just sort of enslaved to the dystonia, but there's something that you can do to help yourself. But if that doesn't work, then then yeah, definitely reach out to, to a health professional. And you talked about some of the neuropsychology in your um, presentation, but we had a question that asked, can the psychological symptoms um, that can be associated with myclonus dystonia, uh, such as OCD, anxiety, and um, and depression, be associated with other types of dystonia? Um, that is a neuropsychological symptom of the dystonia, rather than a result of some of the challenges of living with dystonia. Yeah, I mean, I think there. Uh, uh, Certainly for um, some conditions, there can be higher rates of some things like um, OCD, for example. Um, and some of that, some of the research is, um, it, it's, it's not a not a universally accepted fact that these people are going to have a higher rate of o OCD because it might be a case of that, um, that these conditions run in certain families. And of course, with those families, there'll be certain sort of genetic predispositions to some conditions anyway that might not just be caused by dystonia. And on top of that, there are different ways in which people assess things like OCD in different um, research studies so that it might look like rates are different across different conditions, but it might be a quirk of how it was assessed. But certainly, you know, there does seem to be um, both what we call organic which is caused by um like neurophysiological changes um, uh, and sort of psychological components to to low mood and so but but certainly you know um irrespective of whether there is a sort of organic or a sort of neurophysiological basis to low mood there's certainly um uh, going to be a psychological impact from just living with the condition Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, apologies if I ever pronounce anything incorrectly. Um, regular listeners to the webinars will know that I'm I'm terrible for it. Um, you mentioned and, and something that I just wanted to pick up on during the presentation that people with alopecia have a visible um, 
disability, but the prevalence of anxiety um, isn't as high with with those core cohorts as it is perhaps with people with dystonia, which suggests that something different maybe is happening for people with dystonia, e.g. it's not just dealing with the physical aspect of it. Would, would that be the case? Might it be that sometimes it's the pain that can go along with it or it's other reasons? Yeah, um, I mean, we just don't really know enough. It could be the pain. It could be that different sorts of people get alopecia and different sorts of people get dystonia. And so it might be it might be something that's um, a predisposition to those to those two conditions that's causing a different risk of, of things like anxiety. It could be something to do with the neurophysiology of the condition itself, or it could be something to do with the symptoms, the, the other symptoms that people have to live with, with dystonia. So there's probably so many different variables that it's really hard for researchers to pin down that one thing that causes the low mood or the anxiety. Um, but, but yeah, this, the treatment for it is the same kind of irrespective of what causes it. It's about sort of doing these things to help yourself as well as getting help when, when, um, when you can. Fair enough. It's difficult, isn't it? Because I guess you, you see people with with other long term conditions that are visible and you go, well, why do I feel this way and they feel that way? And I think that it's hard not to compare. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just really interesting because, you know, I see people with I can see one person with um, an incredible level of disability who doesn't feel very anxious or depressed. Um, and then I can meet someone else that's got a very minor amount of disability and that feels overwhelmed by this. And so there's something I feel, there's something about the person who meets the dystonia that really kind of, or, or meets the neurological condition or meets the long-term condition that really sort of can shape how the symptoms are experienced and, and, and the sort of distress that that person um, feels. And so it's, it's not just a case of this condition equals that, because even with um, very high rates of low mood or anxiety in dystonia. Not not everybody with dystonia does get low mood or anxious. Yep. And so, you know, it's not part and parcel of living with it, but obviously um, there are difficulties living with dystonia and the way that we handle those difficulties is, is different for everyone. And I think it's important to clarify that um, if mental health uh, issues like anxiety and compression can be neurophysiological, symptoms rather than just a side effect as it were of living with a long-term condition it doesn't change the fact that dystonia is still a neurological condition right no i mean sometimes i i ask questions i ask um patients coming here about their mood and patients can feel like i'm sort of insinuating in some way that it might be you know all made up in their mind you know um, mm -hmm. which is definitely not the case at all you know with any long-term condition be it neurological or otherwise there's going to be a psychological impact on living with the condition. But when it's a neurological condition, we also know that there's the risk that the underlying neurophysiology might also have a contribution. Um, so, you know, in, in the National Hospital here at Queen Square, we, we always ask about mood for any person that we see with any of the neurological condition, because it's just a very important part of, of um, their experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think people, because Mr. the history of misdiagnosis with dystonia of it sort of being all in your head, you know, we, we've heard that uh, many times from, from the community. I think it it's hard to differentiate the two, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, some people can get very um, concerned about that, but for psychologists, you know, um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a concern that we have that it's, that it's all in your head because really, um, you know what? What does that even mean? Like emotions and and your physical abilities are all coming from your neurological makeup and and you know are affected by your life experience. And so it's very hard for us to tease one apart from the other. You know there is people people will experience um, an emotional reaction as well as emotional consequences of of neurological conditions and it's 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 nearly impossible to, to tease those apart and it, and it's 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 not even helpful necessarily to even try to do so um, from our perspective yeah no that makes sense uh so another question that then that we've had are what are some of the possible effects of a feedback loop between muscle tension caused by dystonia and the potential for the brain to interpret this as a feel as a signal sorry for feeling anxious 
Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good question, and it's you can even think about a even more banal um, sort of uh, example would be you know if if you get a bit out of breath, maybe you run up um, the stairs or something, or you've done something um, that's just made you get slightly out of breath, and then you go to speak to someone. Sometimes you can feel, oh my gosh, I'm a bit anxious because you're slightly breathless. And so if there is a symptom of anxiety and then you think about it, that can then just trigger anxiety. So sometimes when I've given talks to um, a large class um, or a lecture to a large class and I've been slightly breathless <laughs> and then I start to think, oh, my gosh, am I anxious? And then I start to feel really anxious giving the talk, which I would which I would never normally feel anxious about. And so, you know, it makes complete sense. That if someone has some sort of physical tension and they and they notice that physical tension and they're in a situation that can really make them feel like oh my gosh is this anxiety but on top of that there can also be um that uh as you say this feedback loop so this um uh the the, the muscular tension can can just make you a lot more um, stressed out in general, which can then probably increase your risk of feeling more distressed, be that anxiety or a low mood. So, and on top of that, you know, if you're if you're having lots of problems with um, muscular tension, then you're probably not going to be able to sleep very well. Often, sometimes you might have to take something to help you get to sleep, and so all of that will have an impact upon um, your ability to, to think clearly and your your ability to um, uh, process stressful situations, which will probably increase your risk of things like anxiety and, and low mood. I mean, you mentioned sleep there. Can we talk a little bit about how fatigue might affect someone's mental health? So we had an, a webinar earlier this month, which looked at sleep and dystonia. And we know many people with dystonia have a disrupted sleep. Um, but also there can be an increased fatigue from the increased muscle spasms and the movement. And how would that affect your mental health or your mood sort of going through the day and through the week with that level of fatigue, if you like? Yeah, I mean, I think anyone, whether they've got dystonia or not, with fatigue on top, it's just going to make life so much harder. And it also reduces your um, ability to do the things that you enjoy. So if we think back to the sort of um, things that I was talking about that really sort of helps um, promote good mood. One of those things is doing enjoyable activities, and mm -hmm. and you know another another thing of that is another thing is um, socialising. And if those two things are knocked out because you are feeling fatigued or you're not able to do things, then that's going to massively increase your risk of feeling low and feeling anxious. So really, it's the sort of it's not only just feeling. And fatigued and just feeling slightly more heavy in yourself it's actually the knock-on effects of how that affects what you do and so really in order to manage fatigue effectively to try to um, live your life as, as well as you can with these symptoms it's about sort of recognizing how much energy you have and trying to make sure that you don't expend all the energy you have on chores it's 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 sort of um, prioritizing enjoyable activities um, so that you it, it sort of creates a positive feedback loop of the more that you do enjoyable activities the less um, the more you'll want to do it the less fatigue you'll feel and so getting into a positive feedback loop rather than a negative one no that's a brilliant answer i think it's that managing your energy is so important with a long-term chronic condition because you only have i mean everybody only has so much but i think with a with a long-term condition it's I can do one of two things and one of them as you say for for a lot of people that might be chores for my mum she loves a chore but that that wouldn't make me happy so I have to uh and I think people with long-term chronic conditions would go well I can do the one that makes me really happy or I can do the other one and it, it's allowing yourself that permission to ignore the fact that your chores might not be done and do the thing that makes you really happy because then that will give you more energy right yeah, absolutely. And also it's about sometimes delegating. So it's about sort of, you know, sometimes people with dystonia or long-term conditions can feel guilty about asking for help or, um, or, or feel like it's some sort of failure in some way, um, you know, not to be creating sort of three course dinners or something like this, you know, changes um, to what you used to do. But actually if you, if doing 
such activities just drive down the energy you have to be able to do the things that you actually love then i think it's really important to delegate um tasks as much as possible and get and just you know get your get the people around you to, to help out cool thank you um can you comment on how and why stress or anxiety might make specifically neck dystonia cervical worse we've covered some of the things like the feedback loop but, but um on this but perhaps with this sort of that in mind specifically you can give us a bit of a bit of an answer yeah so when we feel anxious we feel lots of different symptoms and people experience it in different ways but typically what we feel is um uh, a sort of tightness across the chest, we feel um, slightly more breathless, we might feel increased muscular rigidity, and all of those things will probably exacerbate any sort of muscular spasms or tension that's already there. And so um, it's very likely that if you're experiencing anxiety, um, particularly, that's going to have an impact upon um, dystonic symptoms, and, and probably any dystonic symptoms. And that's been borne out by research as well, that you know, these symptoms um, can, uh, or that anxiety, depression exacerbate symptoms. We haven't necessarily found that the dystonic symptoms cause anxiety or depression, but they certainly exacerbate the symptoms. Um. I guess that can be true of, of almost anything, isn't it? The, the effect that stress and anxiety, um, as well as depression, but separate even in their own right, can have on the body of anybody. It, it's quite miraculous. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, I mean, our body has been sort of geared up to respond to dangerous situations in a sort of fight or flight response so that we, um, we suddenly, all the um, energy in our body goes into our legs and, and we're getting ready to, to run or getting ready to fight. And so because of that, um, your, your muscles are all tense. And so that's the reason why we have this sort of, um, uh, that, that's why it might um, exacerbate dystonic symptoms but it's um it's a normal response to fear and so you can't get rid of that response to fear it's just about recognizing it and sort of reducing it and, and trying to reduce your overall level of stress or overall level of um, muscular tension to try to um stop your body flaring up quite so much in stressful situations yeah on the sleep webinar we did the they one of the tips they said was that if you're lying in bed trying to go to sleep and you can't maybe get up and just walk around for a moment because it stops that <gasps> I can't go to sleep and I guess that's sort of what you're saying as well is if you can break that loop then hopefully it calms everything down yeah absolutely and then also just by practicing as much relaxation as you can um maybe you know before bedtime or sometime in the day when you're not feeling anxious just trying to really reduce your overall level of sort of um, mental activity, as it were, or physical um, tension, then that should just reduce everything down a little so that you're, you know, so if it is exacerbating your symptoms, it, 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 it won't do quite so much. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, right. I've got to keep a check on time. Uh, on to our next question then, and thank you for all your answers so far. Uh, I think they've been amazingly helpful. But given some of the mental health problems people with dystonia may experience, why is long-term long psychological therapy not a part of a dystonia treatment plan? It's, it's such a good question. And um, I think it goes back to what I was saying before about the NHS is, is mostly sort of geared up for sort of crisis management. You know, there's only so much in the NHS sort of budget and, and that's how it focuses its, its, its funds. But it's, for me, I feel like it's, um, it's a missed opportunity to really, um, to really help people help themselves to think about, you know, um, what's the, what, what would be a better way of living with these long-term conditions. So rather than sort of um, relying upon medications like antidepressants and things like this, it's more about what we should be doing is trying to help support people to support themselves to be able to sort of um, build up their own effective self-management programs um, and, and then just providing the right sort of psychological support for people when they're really struggling. So targeting um, support a bit more um, cleverly rather than just relying upon 
antidepressants and then crisis teams. But yes, I think I think you know more effective psychological therapy um, uh, more available to more people um, it can only be a good thing. Brilliant. Um, okay, and it's tricky, isn't it? Because we're we're campaigning for it. Um, you know, we join the other neurological alliances uh, or the neurological alliances. I have to say. And it's always something that we want to make sure is at the forefront. Um, so in, in collaboration with the NHS and the services they provide, you know, it's always going to be something like uh, like tonight with resources where we will endeavour to, to help provide. But I think um, you've said a couple of times that it's sort of about that self-management as well. And, and sometimes that can be really hard because you don't always recognise that you're in that state. And so I think support is is equally as um, important so that you people can see perhaps when you're spiraling a little bit. Yeah, I think um, I think what's really useful is an assessment by someone, you know, if, you, if you're feeling like something's not quite right or if you're really struggling in some way with dystonia, an assessment from someone that sort of can understand the symptoms, understands what's going on. Um, it can be really useful in just trying to signpost where where the help is mo is best coming from, because you know not everyone with dystonia who has psychological symptoms is going to require psychological therapy, but they might just think need a bit of help to think, gosh, you know maybe I should be doing more, you know relaxation, or maybe I should be exercising, or maybe I need to see people, you know, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people with dystonia find themselves sort of avoiding certain things because they feel worried about what people might say about their condition yeah. and so you know if that's the case then I, it's totally understandable because you know you, you might have experienced such a, a massive change in in the way that you look and and that can be very difficult to to face but but not facing it by by sort of by avoiding situations that make the anxiety grow it sort of gives it room to to breathe and to multiply and, and that means that it can be so much harder to go back to it. So it's sometimes people need a bit of extra support just getting over that hurdle to getting back out and doing the things that they, they, that they used to do to seeing people in the way that they used to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a proper assessment from someone, um, giving them a bit of advice on, 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 on what sort of support is most likely going to be effective for them. And can I just ask, do you think that so one of the things we hear a lot is that nobody knows the condition unless you have it or you know someone that has it. Nobody knows what it is. Does the fact that not only do you have to come to terms with the fact that you have a condition, but then having to sort of explain it on repeat to people that you meet, does that play into it as well, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, I mean, here at Queen's Square, we, we see so many people with very rare conditions, you know, um, sometimes some people have, you know, they're, they're one of only a handful of people in the world that have a condition that's very, um, and so for a lot of the patients we see, they have to end up sort of, you know, describing their condition and symptoms to every single person that they meet, you know, along their journey. And I think it, it can become very wearing, but it's also important to remember that every person with any condition is completely unique. And although someone might know what, say, Parkinson's disease is or have heard of it before, actually their understanding of it can be completely wrong. And, and the way that that condition affects you is completely unique um, because you're a unique person. And so there's, for irrespective of whether, you know, you speak to um, someone who knows what dystonia is or not, and I think that, that it is a burden trying to have to explain it, but in some way it's, it's important because it can, you can have, you can be the author of exactly how it affects you and exactly, you know, to describe, you know, exactly what the dystonia means for you. And I think sometimes people can be burdened with um, a stereotype and in some ways dystonia escapes that. Yeah, no, it's, it's true and not really a, a thought that I had had before. So thank you. Uh, right, on, on to the next question. Um, and the person that sent in this question is referencing a report they read, read just to give you some um, context there which suggests that there may be some cognitive issues that occur more frequently for people with dystonia, um, particularly regarding time estimation in relation to tasks. 
and this can lead to difficulties in estimating how long a task will take or how much can be done within sort of a certain amount of time with the potential to cause pressure and stress. I don't know if you've heard of this research or have any thoughts about it? Um, uh, I, don't, I, I haven't heard of that research, but I, we've done some research into the cognitive profile of dystonia, of cervical, of, um, cervical generalized dystonia. And we've looked to see if there are differences in it and what the pattern of um, any impairment might be. And also I, I do quite a lot of the pre deep brain stimulation assessments, cognitive assessments for people with dystonia here at Queen's Care. And um, I haven't necessarily found a pattern of difficulty, which I would say would be characteristic of dystonia. What I would say is that many people with dystonia might experience some difficulties with concentration or perhaps speed of thinking. And it's very difficult to know how much of that could be explained by um, feeling anxious or low, um, because many of the people that we see also have those issues. And anyone with anxiety or low mood will also um, uh, express these difficulties with concentration and speed of thinking. Um, it might also be an aspect of the condition itself. When we did um, uh, a retrospective study of lots of people that we'd seen with cervical dystonia and generalized dystonia, we found that only a small percentage of people actually formed or demonstrated difficulties in, in any of the neuropsychological tests that we did, uh, but they tended to be on things that involved sort of um, speeded thinking, a speeded complex thinking. And, and, and if you think about sort of estimating time, that's quite a complex sort of task that involves quite a lot of thinking and um, holding something in your mind's eye to really think something through. So what we call working memory or attention. And so it doesn't surprise me that people might have found probably a very subtle difficulty with that, but whether or not that's a specific problem with time estimation or whether it's a more sort of general difficulty with concentration or what we call working memory, I would, I would have thought it would be the latter. And if it, and if, even if it is there, then how much of that is affected by or explained by anxiety or low mood, it's difficult to tell. So my take home message is that it's probably pretty minimal any sorts of cognitive difficulties in dystonia. Of course, it might differ for different conditions within dystonia, but, um, but as a general rule, I, I, I'm, I'm not, not usually particularly worried about cognition in dystonia. Brilliant, thank you. That's a very good answer. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were helping NHS England um, adapt their improving access to um, physiological therapies, the IMAP program, for people with neurological conditions. And you told us a bit about it, but can you talk a bit about your involvement in representing people with uh, neurological conditions and the needs they may have? Yeah, so I have been helping um, Neurological Alliance um, sort of uh, represent them uh, along with the neuropsychiatrist just thinking through helping NHS England think through how to adapt their um, treatment for long-term conditions so this is for people with diabetes and um, heart conditions these are the long-term conditions that they currently see and um, we have been trying to help them think through how that might need to be adapted for people with neurological conditions such as dystonia or Parkinson's or any other type of neurological condition and um, so far it's been very sort of um, broad and not particularly focused and that's because they want it to be sort of purposely broad and not particularly focused, they want to make sure that it's inclusive as possible. And then Neurological Alliance is going to work with um, uh, IACT, this Increasing Access to Psychological Therapies of NHS England, to, to try to provide more detailed advice on each of the conditions so that um, the person who who you might meet um, at an IAPT um, therapy centre would might have a sense of if they don't know the condition how to access information about the condition and then but but you know still will want to know everything about you and um, how the condition affects you how the symptoms affects you. Brilliant thank you we started a bit late and we've got two more questions so if it's all right with you we'll just whiz was through the last um, couple. Uh, the first of which is how long on average is the wait for assessment in a neuropsychologist clinic to gain help with the condition? For context, this particular person is under uh, Queen Square, so you might know very well how long that wait time is. Well, I think it's got a bit sort of 
shoved back by the pandemic, as I'm sure everyone is sick of hearing. Um, uh, but, you know, we try to see people within three months here at Queen's Fair, but, you know, um, it depends. There are, there is a, a lack of neuropsychologists around the UK. So um, at Queen's Square, we have lots, but, you know, around the UK, there's very patchy access. And so it's, uh, um, you know, we're a tertiary centre, which means that, you know, other specialist centres can refer to us. But for other special centres, sometimes there aren't, there are no neuropsychologists. So it can be really difficult for people to access this. So this is why we've been trying to campaign for more neuropsychologists to provide this sort of expert um, uh, advice so that um, an expert assessment and um, so that people with dystonia and other neurological conditions can meet with someone who understands um, and can and someone who can provide a bit more specialist advice. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's a not a very easy answer, not, not a very easy question to answer, but um, but yeah. We like question time. We like the difficult question. <laughs> um, and any other BBC or ITV program that does that just for, <laughs> can't be uh, specific. Um, and perhaps if it is a long way, then just uh, getting back to what you said, some of the things earlier that you mentioned about practicing some of the ways to help your own mental health, would you would you suggest that even before they've seen someone that they try and get into those habits? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, uh, I would say that the fast lot of people that I speak to, um, I end up sort of recommending these things anyway. And so, you know, you can sort of save, save yourself a lot of time and effort by just sort of trying to trying to enact some of these sort of strategies by, you know, really trying to get your activities up, doing more positive things, trying to get your exercise regime up and running, um, socialising, working out who's in your network, how do you get more people into your network, how do you connect more with Estonia communities, or how do you, how do you make sure that, you know, you spend more time with your friends, you know, these sorts of things. Um, you know, try to do that and then see, you know, I, I reckon that you'll probably experience an improvement in your mood. But if, but even if you don't, then at least, you know, you've given it your best shot and you're trying to, trying to make your life the one that you want to lead as opposed to um, just feeling like the dystonia is in control, which a lot of people will struggle with. Brilliant. Thank you. So last question for you. Uh, now, we know that not everyone experiences pain with dystonia, but some do. What can you advise to someone who is living with that sort of chronic pain and may struggle to do some of the things that could help with their mental health physically? Yeah, I think chronic pain is a really difficult one. Um, and it, it does certainly complicate anxiety and low mood. But what also makes it hard is that, that it, it, it's, it's a bit of a feedback thing like we were talking about before is that the pain makes the anxiety and depression worse, but the anxiety and depression makes the pain worse. And so sometimes it's hard to know really what you're dealing with and really all the same things that work for low mood and anxiety are probably going to make the pain a little bit better as well. So I think it's about sort of building up your regime of enjoyable activities, exercise, socialising as much as you can, but bearing in mind that pain, fatigue, sleep problems are all, are all sort of working against you, but just trying to do your best as much as you can and getting the help when, when you need to. Amazing. Thank you so much. I can't believe how fast that hour whizzed by. I think I could talk to you all night and I'm going to guess that everybody else could listen to you talk, not me, but you talk all night. Um, so thank you so much. And I, I know everyone else will, will join me in that in that. Thanks. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us today or might be watching this at a later time. Um, I, I think there's a lot that we can take away from, from the things that Jennifer said. And I think that we'll certainly, as a team, we'll be looking at, at how we can get information out there as we do the webinars for you. Um, I, I will say Jennifer mentioned how good exercise is. So we'd love to see you all signing up to Dystonia around the world next year. That would be amazing. Uh, you don't actually have to do physical exercise on that. You can get your miles any way you like. Pop over to the website to have a look. Uh, well, I've got to tell you, as I mentioned, the recording will be available um, early next week on our website. But in the meantime, you can catch up 
with all of our previous webinars and we've done some really great ones and Victoria if you wouldn't mind has already popped a link in the chat for me uh, so all that is left for me to say is thank you Jennifer Dr Jennifer Foley for joining us um, I would also like to thank Victoria uh, who has been very kindly collating all the questions and Fran who is brilliant on tech tonight uh, so my team thank you very much and thank you all for listening have a wonderful night and we will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.